Uh, so I just want to give a little bit of an overview before we dive into Anthony's experience with the Michigan Redistricting Commission um, by just talking about uh, different processes and um, how they set up their commissions in other states as we in Pennsylvania hope to maybe get our own commission for the next round of redistricting. So just a quick overview of what I'll be focusing on um, just briefly is we're going to talk about independence. We tend to just loop it, lump in independent redistricting commissions as a phrase. All redistricting commissions are not inherently independent or created equal, so we're going to dive into why how we set up commissions is really important for the outcomes. We're going to talk about the process, specifically whether there are fail-safes available for if commissioners don't agree, which we'll see happens a lot. And then finally, we'll briefly discuss outcomes before we look at the gold standard commission, which is Michigan. Next slide, please. Awesome. So I just want to go over how other states have set up their commissions. Uh, so Ohio, first of all, uh, technically the legislature is able to draw a map first. So in Ohio, the legislature has the chance to draw their congressional maps. If they don't get 60% of the legislature, including 50% of each party, to agree on a map, it then gets punted to the independent commission. That independent commission is made up of seven individuals, three of which are elected officials themselves, the governor, the auditor, and the secretary of state. And then each majority and minority leader in both chambers of the Ohio State Legislature gets to appoint someone to that commission. So there's very little independence. It's a very political commission. Virginia, on the other hand, has 16 people on its commission, eight citizens who are appointed by former judges, and then eight uh, appointees of legislators um, appointed once again by the majority and minority leaders of the legislature. So once again, it's about split half and half but it's still um, primarily a partisan commission. And finally, Michigan just randomly selects citizens, um, four Republicans, four Democrats, and then five nonpartisan individuals. Um, and as Anthony will describe, they are randomly selected. So why this is so important, as we'll see on the next slide, who you put on your commission uh, plays a huge role in determining how that process will play out. So in Ohio, they have a lot of rules. So if the commission in the legislature does not approve maps, maps in a bipartisan manner, they're only valid for four years. So just to give you a bit of the Ohio story, bear with me, it's pretty complicated. Um, so they started off with the legislature drawing a map. It was not bipartisan, so it was booted to the commission. The commission drew a map that the courts found to be unconstitutional. So then the state legislature once again had a chance of drawing their congressional maps. Uh, once again, the state legislature did not draw maps that were received by partisan support. Um, when they draw the maps in the second round, the Ohio Commission, the constitutional amendment that they passed, requires them to provide detailed explanations on how their maps fit into criteria such as compactness, proportionality, um, contiguity, and then preserving units of government. So they're required to provide a written account of why they drew their map the way they did. Once again, the Ohio legislature failed to draw a map that the courts found to be constitutional, and then they just stopped drawing. <laughs> so they currently used maps that were deemed unconstitutional for their general election, um, and they will have to draw them again before uh, the next redistricting cycle. So Ohio is an example um, very clearly of how commissions can fail. Virginia, on the other hand, is a bit of a mixed bag. So the Virginia Commission got together 16 individuals, eight citizens, eight legislators, um, and they appointed special masters to draw draft maps. The way they did it is they had a Republican master and then a Democrat master draw their maps. Um, so they were going to vote on which map to use as a draft map. So of course, the commission, as you might expect, met to agree on which map to use as their starting point. So they have one map that's labeled Republican and one map that's labeled Democratic, and they voted 8-8 on which map to use, shocker. Um, they could not agree. Someone actually just left the meeting, never to join the commission again, uh, because they couldn't get anywhere, because they were explicitly drawing maps in a partisan manner and thinking that somebody was going to cross the aisle to pick that other party's map. So Virginia, for both their congressional maps and their state legislative maps, they could not agree on anything, which meant the process went to the Supreme Court to draw those maps. So at least in Virginia, they did have a backup for if commissions could not agree on what to draw. Uh, so the Virginia Supreme Court 
um, put together a list of names on special masters to draw the maps. Um, they gave the legislative leaders power to eliminate one or two names. Ultimately, it came down to two special masters, one from each party. Um, these people would be tasked with drawing the map. So they drew the map, gave the public time to comment, and as we'll talk about in the outcome, um, it is a pretty fair map, but unfortunately, because there was no commission, we didn't have as transparent as a process as you might want to have when it's kind of drawn by special masters appointed by the court. Michigan, on the other hand, like I said, the gold standard, as Anthony will talk about, um, they had transparency during the mapping process. Their commission is set up so that nonpartisan individuals have a um, plurality on the commission. Um, they agreed on a schedule of mapping before they started. They held public hearings across the state. And ultimately, they proposed maps without partisan labels. So they were all voting on maps named after trees, as Anthony will talk about, rather than labeled Democrat or Republican. And then to agree on maps, uh, they used ranked choice voting. So on the next slide, I'll just go over the outcomes. So Ohio, thumbs down. So ultimately, they are voting on unconstitutional maps that will only be valid for four years or two general election cycles. Um, and they didn't get anywhere. And they eventually just stopped drawing maps and stopped following the law, essentially. Virginia, they didn't have agreement by commissioners, but at least they had a backup plan for what to do if they didn't agree. That power was sent to the courts. And they came up with a pretty fair map. Um, the election results were 52-48 for congressional seats, and they have a 6-5 split. So it's a pretty proportional map. And then in Michigan, they had agreement on all maps. Um, and ultimately, they had a very proportional result and a very transparent process. And I just wanted to give this as kind of a preface to Anthony's presentation to describe how it's really important in Pennsylvania before we just say we want an independent commission, we really have to think about how we want that commission to be structured, what are the backups when that commission doesn't agree, what do we want to make sure they are set up to do. We don't want to set them up to fail like so many other states unfortunately have. Um, so we want to put a lot of thought into that heading into our advocacy before our next round of redistricting. So my understanding of the like legal framework is that the one side is arguing that the commission is not the state legislature, so they don't have to, they have like total power um, in drawing the maps, whereas the legislature has to follow more strict rules. That was probably like very not legal language, but that's my general understanding. Um, but the Supreme Court chose not to hold them in contempt of the law when they stopped drawing maps. So that's still very much an ongoing, there are lots of lawsuits out there, um, but we're still kind of watching that saga unfold. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I can briefly just say I picked these because they're most similar to Pennsylvania as a state. You know, Virginia is a commonwealth. They're both, um, you know, mid-Atlantic states, um, states in the Midwest, Rust Belt states, um, and obviously they have a good variety of outcomes. Um, I would say like, yeah, Colorado, Arizona, um, California, New York, they all have relatively success successful mapping um, commissions. Um, but I think Michigan was the one that had the most uh, favorable in terms of the public outcome. I know there were some controversial decisions in both Arizona and Colorado with their independent commissions, particularly in terms of communities of interest. Um, and something else I would note that Anthony talked about um, this morning was that Michigan has criteria and they're ranked in level of importance, which is something I think other commissions don't have that is also really key. So that there's actually like, you can argue that any map is a good map, and there's never going to be a perfect map. So I think other commissions kind of falter to Michigan in that they don't have that specific criteria to use in a certain order of what they should be prioritizing, if that somewhat answers your question. Any other questions before we move on to Anthony? OK, thank you, everyone. All right, thank you, Michael, for that, uh, for teeing me up there and comparing Michigan to some of the other processes in the country. Man, Ohio, right? Who can believe it? It's just another reason why Michigan's better. Go blue. Am I right? <laughs> Ohio's probably going to make the college football playoff now, and you know we'll just beat him again. So that'll be great. All right, y'all. I'm Anthony Ede. I'm going to be presenting today on Michigan's Independent Citizens Redistricting Commission. I really feel that this is a model that can potentially be used nationwide for states that are looking to get new independent redistricting commissions. So I'm kind of coming at this presentation uh, as I would do like a science research presentation. And in those, we always have disclosures at the beginning. So let's start. These opinions are my own. They might not represent the whole commission. 
Uh, no outside funds are used to create this. There's going to be some legal jargon, but I'm not a lawyer, so take those with a grain of salt. And I have plenty of sources on here. We have our own website. We have some friends at U of M and MSU, Voters Not Politicians, Princeton Gerrymandering Project. Most of y'all should recognize these. Let's move forward. So history, went over this a little earlier. In 2018, Michigan voters passed Proposal 2018-2 that created the Michigan Independent Citizens Redistricting Commission, comprised of 13 randomly selected Michigan voters uh, from the application pool, and we're responsible for drawing our congressional, state house, and state senate maps. I was quite surprised to learn earlier today that y'all have 203 house seats. <laughs> wow. I, you know, before doing this, I actually did not know Michigan had 110. And learning that, I was pretty surprised. But to do almost double that at 203, I couldn't imagine. That is a lot of representation there. We also have uh, 38 House seats and 13 US congressional seats. We had 14, uh, but according to this last census cycle, we've gone down to 13. One of our core values is transparency. Uh, con transparency is constitutionally guaranteed. We have to follow the Open Meetings Act. And all of our meetings were live, from the first random drawing process where we were, we were selected, to interviewing our staff. You know, I always feel bad for our staff, because who would want to do an interview on YouTube in front of like the whole state watching? But, but they did it, and the public commented on their applications and commented on their interviews, and the public had a say in who we hired. And finally, in the map drawing. All of our map drawing happened live. Uh, people could comment in real time while we were drawing maps. People could submit maps to us. Um, so you know, transparency was really one of the core values of this commission. And um, finally, even all of our mapping data was available to the public. So any line, even a single change that was drawn to any single district would be uploaded to our public portal for the public to see and do their own analyses on or submit comment to us if they wanted to. So as Michael said, structure is very, very important when it comes to these. And I think the biggest strength of our commission was the structure. Having the three pools of applicants, four Democrats, four Republicans, and five independents created a situation where we had to come to compromise in order to get anything passed. I happen to think that's a good thing. Michigan is a purple state. There are people on both sides of the aisle, lots of moderates on both sides, lots of independents. And uh, having to come up with that compromise so one side couldn't team up with each other or railroad the other side, uh, I think was a big reason why we were successful in these maps. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, also, another thing is we have open primaries in Michigan, which you know I know is something that y'all don't have here. But uh, because we have open primaries, those pools of applicants were self-identifying. Now, finally, here's a little bit of a, of a grand overview of the phases that we went through with the process. As you can see, there were quite a few phases. The first three are above that blue line, because that's what the state did. And everything below that blue line is what we did as an independent commission. So you start by the application process. There was an application you had to fill out, um, but pretty much the only requirements were you had to be a registered voter and you couldn't have any family members that were, like direct family members that were a part of the legislature or were lobbyists or stuff like that. They did the random drawing and then they convened the commission. After we convened, uh, we hired staff. We then went on our first round of public hearings. Uh, the census data was delayed, so we got our census data a little later this cycle. We then drew our initial maps. We then took those initial maps on a second round of public hearings to hear what folks thought of them. Then we improved the maps with that public input. Finally, we selected proposed maps, and those proposed maps went into a 45-day public comment window. After those 45 days were up, we voted to adopt maps. That's where we're at now. Uh, the maps are adopted into law. They were used for this last election. Um, and now we're fighting a few lawsuits and considering how to disband. Everything in this process was included in the Michigan Constitution. So it's going to have to be used in the future. It wasn't just like a policy thing that we did. Um, so I'll do our public hearings and then I have a slide on the random selection process. So. According to the Michigan Constitution, before drawing any maps, we had to go on at least 10 public hearings. 
Because the census data was delayed, we had a little bit more time on our hands before we could put pen to paper and start drawing. We were able to use that time to go to 15 different cities uh, around our state. You can see on this map here, we went places all the way from Detroit, all the way up here to the Upper Peninsula in Marquette. We really tried to visit every part of our state. And on top of these public hearings, we also went to smaller parts of towns, you know, in libraries and coffee shops to let people know what we were doing, uh, make them aware of the new redistricting process, and make sure uh, that their voices could be heard. After that initial drawing, we again went to five of these cities again in order to hear what they thought. We also went on a university tour at um, you know, the various 15 public universities around our state uh, to hear what students thought of our maps and uh, try to get input from a variety of age groups. In total, there were about 30,000 public comments when you combine the written public comment, the in-person testimony, and all the emails we got. And I'm proud to say that I read and listened to every single one of them. <laughs> so I spoke to earlier today about our redistricting criteria. Uh, I have them listed out here. And again, these are according to the Constitution. If another state wants to do independent redistricting, I think these criteria are key. Because it makes it so that the commission has criteria that they need to follow. They can't just do whatever they want. To be legal maps, you got to prove that you followed this. And what's interesting is that these are ranked. So the top criteria overrule the, the lesser criteria. Something that's interesting about Michigan uh, compared to other states are things like county lines, city lines, township lines are quite a bit lower on the list of criteria than things like communities of interest and partisan fairness. Um, there are a lot of opinions about that. I didn't choose that but the Michigan voters choose, chose that when they adopted the constitutional criteria. And it did create a benefit in that we were able to get uh, advocacy from specific communities that might not always live in a compact area and make districts uh, where, the, where their voices could be heard as well. And I have some examples of that later. What even is a community of interest, right? It's this vague term. And it, you know, it, it is vague in some ways. It's kind of purposely vague because you don't want it to be exclusive but there are also things it doesn't include. So here's the language in the Constitution. Uh, historical and economic interests would be one thing. Cultural, uh, geographical interests could be another. But what's important is what it's not. A community of interest is not a political party. It is not a political ideology uh, or supporting incumbent or current uh, potential candidates. How did we collect these public comments? We had multiple types of submission tools. Um, if you go to michiganmapping.org, we have a tool to submit a community of interest, to submit a public comment map. That used a District R tool set. And after we proposed maps, we posted them online via a state website. And people could make little pin drops uh, in specific locations on those maps to, uh, to tell us what they thought. These were all then compiled, right? It's like 30,000 comments. How do you, how do you, uh, you know, sort through all that? Well, you know, we had some good people to help. Uh, these heat maps were created by the MGG Lab, uh, MGG G Lab by uh, Dr. Moon Duchin, and they were able to compile a bunch of the individual public comments and turn them into these heat maps that the commission was then able to use to see where the most common areas of interest were. And uh, you know, these maps were a big deal. They were one of the main things I looked at when drawing the, uh, the congressional map that ended up being passed. All in all, it created 42 different of these clusters around the state. You see that one in the center, that's the Lansing area. You see the one on the bottom left, that is like the, uh, the St. Clair Shores, or St. Clair Shore, uh, excuse me, St. Clair Shores area um, northeast of Detroit. And these public comments, they really did end up in the final map. On the left here, I uh, wish you could see it better, but we have a, a testimony from an individual from West Bloomfield advocating for West Bloomfield to be included in their surrounding counties because previously it had, uh, for political reasons, been put with uh, more northern counties that were, did not have a community of interest with West Bloomfield. On the right is the district that ended up in the final map, District 20, which recombined West Bloomfield with its fellow neighbors. Next slide. 
Here's a public comment about Dearborn Heights, an Arab American community of interest. Um, and you can see on the left, that is the map the individual submitted. Right here. You can see the final map, the district, district number 15, that ended up being added, uh, is pretty darn close to that comment. Next slide. This is one of those non-compact communities of interest I, was, I talked about. And this is actually one of my favorite ones in the whole map. We had uh, quite a large outcry from lakeshore communities of interest that rely on the lakes, rely on tourism, and rely on agriculture in order to support their way of life. On the left, you can see the uh, community of interest that that individual submitted. And on the right, you can see the final uh, district that ended up in the map. In the congressional map as well, congressional maps are uh, you know, much bigger districts. Here's an example of a community of interest of the border counties between Michigan and Ohio and Michigan and Indiana. You know, we had folks say that these counties shared uh, numerous interstate interests with their neighboring states, people crossing state lines to do business, to go shopping, even to pray. And you can see on the left, that community of interest submission, there wasn't quite enough population in there, but we were able to add a little bit more to it and created District 5 as a, as a border community of interest in the congressional map. As well as community of interest, we really wanted to take a data-based, evidence-based driven approach. Uh, as well, on top of doing a racial uh, voting block analysis, we also undertook the first ever Arab American and Bengali voting pattern uh, study. I believe it's the first one of its kind conducted in the country. On the left here, you can see, uh, and, you know, it's especially important because the census doesn't have all different types of immigrant, group, immigrant groups on it. For example, there's no checkbox on the census for uh, Middle Eastern or North African individuals. That often silences populations because they essentially go invisible. They either have to check other or white, and uh, most people in those communities don't identify as either of those races. So on the left, you can see a small ethnic Chaldean uh, population. We were able to determine where those folks were. And on the right, District 57, you can see that the district that was created reflected their community of interest. Big question here. Can counties be communities of interest? This is a question that our commission wrestled with for quite a while because we had folks coming in saying, my community of interest, my community of interest is my county. Well, that creates a problem for us because some of the more sparsely populated counties, if we were to make them their own district, it would dilute the proportionality of the map overall. Um, what we were actually ended up being advised was that county lines were specifically mentioned in the constitutional criteria to be a lower priority than communities of interest. And because they were specifically put as county lines, city lines, and township lines, as being lower, we decided that they were not communities of interest and had county splits be a lower priority than the types of communities of interest I was uh, just speaking about on previous slides. Okay, so those are COIs. Finally, the census data came in. What are the major takeaways from the census in this cycle? Well, Detroit lost population to the suburbs. Um, we also even though Michigan overall gained slight population, we lost a congressional seat, so it went from 14 to 13. And then the suburbs of Detroit, Oakland County, Wayne County, and western Michigan, the Grand Rapids and Kent County areas were the fastest growing parts of the state. After getting that census data, we were able to start drawing maps. We had two concurrent processes to draw maps. The first was the live collaborative process where commissioners one by one would in real time take turns with our GIS software to draw districts. I could draw a district, then my fellow commissioner after me could edit that district, then the next one could edit that district, and if there were ever two districts that were in opposition, opposition to each other, we would just create a new map and have both choices out there for the public to hear. Through this process, we quite literally made hundreds of different maps that we uh, sorted through. And then while that process was happening, individual commissioners could also submit their own uh, completed maps for the commission to then see and take up. Anyways, we had, so this was our initial dr uh, first draft of maps. We ended up having 20 drafts um, that were 
brought on our second round of public comments. So we had all of these maps printed out for the public to see, and we took them to five different cities uh, to hear what people thought of them. So funny thing, we named our maps after trees, right? We did this for a few reasons. One, bias is a specific interest of mine being you know, in, in the medical field. We talk about bias all the time. And we, uh, in this process, we had things like implicit bias training uh, with the commissioners and a whole bunch of other types of bias uh, were examined. And we, we didn't want to bias, there we go, success. There we go, thank you. We didn't want to bias any map from each other by naming it something. So, you know, being from Michigan, it was either going to be trees or cars. And we decided on trees, you know. And my vote would have been for cars, personally. You know, we could have a Mustang map, we could have a Corvette map, that'd be good, Stingray. But here are the choices that we took to our first round of public comments. You can see there were uh, about eight or nine congressional plans. There was six state house plans and six state senate plans. Next slide. Thank you. We took these proposed maps on that second round of public comment I was talking about. After that second round of public comment was complete, we then took the advice we got from folks uh, during the public comment period, and we used it to improve our maps and make sure the maps were as compliant with law as possible. At this point, we then submitted, submitted uh, final proposed maps. Now, this is an important stopgap here, because at this point in the process, no new changes could be made, because if they were, it would restart the 45-day public comment window. And we didn't have time to do that because of the census delay and because of the deadlines that are in the Michigan Constitution to pass a map. So this was a, a real important deadline that we had in order to create enough time for folks to have 45 days to comment and enough time for us to take those comments and actually vote to adopt a plan. So here were the final, uh, the final maps that were submitted to that 45-day public comment window. In green are the collaborative maps. You see we have Chestnut. Chestnut was previously an individual commissioner's plan, but because of the public comment uh, during that period where we were improving them, it became a collaborative map where the whole commission took the work of the individual commissioner and edited it in real time so that it can meet the needs of the whole commission. And we had three collaborative maps in each category, and then we also had the individual commissioner maps after that. Now, I think it was, a, you know, it wasn't a need, but it was certainly a want for us to adopt collaborative maps, uh, not only because they were the most transparent and the most in public, but also because even if an individual commissioner disagreed with certain parts of the map, we all, all of the commissioners had a, had a hand in making it. So even if you didn't like some parts, there were certainly some parts that each commissioner did like. Voting process. So at this point, the 45-day public, the final 45-day public comment window ended, and we went through our voting process. Um, we did have ranked choice voting, but that was actually our second method. The first method in the Michigan Constitution is getting a majority of votes while also having two commissioners in each pool of candidates uh, accept a map. So in order to pass a map, we need two Republicans, two Democrats, two independents, plus one more to get majority. That's the best and the first option. If that option did not work, which it did luckily, and I think it did work because of the collaborative process that we had, but if it didn't, we would then move on to the ranked choice voting process where commissioners would rank their top choices, but even in that process, you had to have two votes in the top half of your rank uh, be from two Democrats, two Republicans, and two Independents. And then if that also didn't work, there was a third option, and we called this the nuclear option, uh, where every commissioner would pick one map to put into a pool, and the Secretary of State would randomly select it. <laughs> Luckily, we did not have to do that. The method one prevailed, and we were able to pass maps, uh, not unanimously, but with a majority of commissioners, and uh, that had a commis commissioners from each pool vote for it. Here are the final maps that were adopted, and these are results uh, from, the, from this previous uh, 2022 election. We're finally gonna start talking about outcomes. On the left, you have the Chestnut uh, Congressional map. Uh, in the middle, you have the Hickory House map, and on the right, you have the Linden uh, State Senate map. Oh, Miss Spell, I, you know, I wasn't an English major. Spelling's always been a, a weak point of mine. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. 
far as in fairness metrics, you know, like I said, we wanted to take a data-based, evidence-backed uh, approach to this process. Uh, and in order to achieve this, we took a 10-year election history, the previous 10 years of elections, and compiled them into a composite score in order to figure out our partisan fa fairness measures. If we look at the top on the congressional map, you can see that the composite score on efficiency gap, and keep in mind, some people disagree with what measures to use, so we used four different measures. Um, and all of them were much closer to being fair than what the previous maps drawn by the legislature were. In, in all the maps, three of the four measures still had a slight Republican lean, but they were close enough to zero that the commission felt comfortable with it. And more importantly, the data showed that in years where Democrats got the most votes, they would likely get the most seats. And likewise, in years where Republicans got the vo votes, they would also get the most seats. I have a comparison here between three previous elections, 2016, where uh, uh, the Republican candidate, Donald Trump, won by a slim margin. Then you have 2018 midterm election, where the Democrats, was, it was a wave that year. Uh, they won by a quite significant margin. And then you have a, the 2020 presidential election, where the, 20, where the Democratic candidate, Joe Biden, won, but by a much smaller majority than what had been shown in the 2018 election. And if you go through all this data, basically what you see is that the maps are fair. We went from an efficiency gap of plus 12% Republican in the congressional map to 0.6%. And uh, I believe that's the lowest number according to 538 of any map in the country. The data also stays consistent with the, uh, the state legislature maps. You can see in red there, that bottom number is what it was previously, and on top in bold is the uh, composite number for each data point used. Next slide. Here's what uh, the Princeton Gerrymandering Project said about our maps. They rated them pretty, pretty good overall at uh, you know, A's and B's. No partisan advantage or, or a very slight partisan advantage. Now, their, number, their data points are a little different than ours. We use 10 years of election history. Princeton Gerrymandering Project weighs more recent elections at a greater number. Uh, than elections further away, while we weighed all 10 years of elections equally, so that could account for that number difference. But overall, uh, you know, pretty good marks from third parties overall. And outcomes, this was before the election. Uh, quite a lot of good news. Uh, folks said that, you know, the maps essentially leveled the playing field and made it so that, you know, there's fairness, there's proportionality, and uh, that was the goal. Here's a few more headlines. Uh, probably my favorite one is that New York Times article, uh, ungerrymandered, Michigan maps independently drawn, set up a fair fight. Um, it, it wasn't a goal of ours per se to make competitive districts because that wasn't one of the seven ranked criteria, but it turned out that by following the other criteria, these districts were significantly more competitive than what had happened in the past. And that created a situation in this past election where quite a lot of incumbents were defeated. You can see that headline on the bottom, uh, nine, Michigan legislatures, uh, nine Michigan lawmakers tossed out by voters. Next slide. Um, here's a comparison. This is from 538. Uh, you can see on top the new house map versus on bottom the old house map. And you can see um, you know, the, the lighter shades of colors on top representing uh, a more equitable and more proportional and more competitive races. And you know, this is probably my favorite slide in this whole thing. Uh, this shows that the proportionality of our maps matched up almost exactly with what the vote share was. So for the congressional map, Democrats got 51% of, of the votes, they got seven seats. In the state house, they got just over 50% of the vote, and they got just over 50% of the seats at 56 to 54. And in the state Senate, they got uh, almost 51%, and they got 20 seats to 18. So you know, a lot of headlines I've seen over the past uh, few weeks say, oh, well, you, know, you guys just did a Democratic gerrymander. You, know, you guys put the thumbs on the scales for Democrats. And you know, that really couldn't be further from the truth. In fact, like I said earlier, three of the four measures for partisan fairness still actually favor Republicans. But it just so happens in this election, uh, for various reasons, 
uh, a lot more people voted for Democrats. But in the future, there's certainly a scenario where people vote for Republicans, and if they do, then they will also end up with the majority of seats. This is another table that kind of shows the same thing. Um, the closer these lines are together, the closer the proportionality is. So you can see, especially like here in 2014, these lines are you know, further apart. And that means one party got a disproportionate amount of votes compared to the uh, amount of seats and power they ended up being able to hold. And as you can see, we go to 2022, the first election under the new maps, uh, you know, the lines are overlapping. Okay, it's not all good, right? We, we did have some criticisms. Uh, we do have a few lawsuits in play right now about uh, potential VRA issues. Um, so, you know, that is still yet to be adjudicated. Uh, you know, I think a lot of this comes from folks not, uh, and again, I'm not a lawyer, but this is what our lawyers have told us. Um, you know, a candidate of choice doesn't necessarily need to be the same race as uh, the minority community that is electing them. For example, Detroit is a, about a 75% black city, but we've elected a white mayor the past three election cycles, and there's no district in that race, so no one can say it's, it's, a, you know, it's due to the district. Uh, next slide. Likewise, you know, again, data, data, data. That was the thing we wanted to hit. We conducted the racial block voting analysis it showed that in the past, districts were heavily packed with black voters uh, in order to dilute their representation and give them the least amount of district power possible. Uh, that in hand also made the la uh, maps less proportional because in Michigan, black voters vote overwhelmingly Democratic. Because of this history, we were advised to reduce that number of massively packed districts to a much lesser number to still give folks the ability to elect their candidates of choice, but increase the overall number of opportunity districts where they would able, be able to have their voice heard. And a good example of this is, is in Detroit. Um, in the 2018 cycle, in the 2020 cycle, where we had 14 congressional districts, there were two minorities, one black rep, Brenda Lawrence, and both of those reps, Brenda Lawrence and Rashida Tlaib, were the black candidate of choice. Fast forward to the 2022 election, where we lost a congressional map, so one less potential seat, only 13 instead of 14, the minority representation actually went up. You have Rashida Tlaib, uh, Shri Tanadar, and John James. The interesting thing is, the black candidate, John James, is most likely not the black candidate of choice which you know, it throws people for a loop because most people think, oh, black people are gonna automatically vote for the black candidate, but that's not the case. It was actually his opponent that was the black candidate of choice, but John James got more votes. Likewise, Rashida Tlaib and Sri Tanadar uh, got a plura plurality of black votes in their primaries. So while we haven't done a racial voting, voting block analysis on these maps quite yet, I think when we do, it's likely to show that these candidates were in fact the black candidate of choice and the opportunity for the community to elect uh, is still there. But that's yet to be seen. You know, we'll see how these lawsuits play out. Uh, we did have one in the state Supreme Court that ruled in our favor. And uh, we have a few more in federal court to work out. So challenges. COVID-19 was a big issue. You know, we had to start our meetings remotely. Um, and that kind of created a lack of camaraderie between the commissioners. Um, later on in the process, we were able to meet in person, and that was a lot better for teamwork, a lot better for just working together and getting that compromise we were talking about earlier. There was the delay in the census data that created less time to draw maps, and we had to actually blow past the constitutional deadline and get a special exception by the court to get an extension uh, because the voting, uh, you know, the census data wasn't there, so we couldn't draw. Um, primary election data, we need more of it. Um, there weren't that many contested primary elections in Michigan in the past. I think in the next 10 years, due to these maps, there will be, and that'll help make future commissions uh, you know, exhibit even better decision-making processes than we did. Uh, there was also safety. So we had a few safety issues during this process. There was a, a lot of vitriol from both sides of the aisle. Um, at one point, we had a, a very serious gun threat where someone submitted a comment saying they were gonna come shoot us all. 
we had to go on lockdown, and it was it was a mess. But uh, everyone was okay, luckily. But so so I think having some security in the future would probably be good. And then uh, the challenges of the lawsuits that are ongoing. So lessons learned. What you want is clear but flexible constitutional criteria. You want some criteria that the commission has to listen to, but maybe don't go as far as having you have to be done by this date because maybe another pandemic happens and you kind of blow through it. Um, we had a relatively small staff. We had an executive director, a legal counsel, and a communications director. Um, and our budget was pretty small too. We were just working with about three million a year, uh, which is a fraction of what other similarly sized commissions um, are. For example, Arizona has about the same population as Michigan, but they spend uh, almost 12 million a year on their initiatives. We're doing it with only three. Um, but uh, having a, a good professional staff to advise the commission and for the commission to direct to get work done uh, would be very valuable in the future. Uh, faster geographical training, faster GIS software training, uh, things like uh, you know office spaces, which were hard to come by during the pandemic. A, a lot of these can be traced back to the pandemic. Um, and finally, compromise. You know, people have to be okay with compromise. I, I would recommend future commissioners if they sign up to have their name in the pool, be ready to compromise and be ready to, you know, have your life be very public from that point forward. All right, Q&A. I did, I did have one question earlier about the, uh, the application process. I guess that slide must have got deleted, but pretty much it was uh, self-identifying. There was a, a, an application that you had to get notarized and submit it. Very few questions. It was like, why do you want to be on this commission? Uh, what do you hope to achieve? Stuff like that. But even someone could have filled out a blank application with just their name, as long as they were a registered voter and they didn't have family in government, uh, they still would have been entered into the random drawing. There were about 10,000 applicants. From the 10,000 applicants, there was, a there was a first round of random drawing that went to 200. At that point, uh, each majority minority group, the, the Republicans and the Democrats, were able to each strike out 10 names. That brought it to 180 applicants. And then out of those 180, there was a final drawing to get it down to the four Republicans, four Democrats, and five independents needed. All right, I got, I got a lot of questions. Uh, let's start, start up top, I guess. Uh, two questions. Uh, one is, was there uh, any attempt to diversify the committee? So the, f the first question, there were some geographical weights put um, on the random drawing. I'm not sure exactly what they were. They're on the Secretary of State's website, um, not, but not racial. They were geographic. Okay. In the future, and you know, so there's, thir there's 13 of us on this commission. There are three minorities, myself and two other black women. Um, but you know, Michigan's a pretty diverse place. There's, you know, we have a very large enclave of Asian Americans, a very large enclave of uh, Native Americans, uh, of Indian Americans, Bengali Americans. It's really a, a quite a diverse state, and um, it would be nice to see in the future to have some more, uh, you know, a little bit more better racial representation there, and also possibly a better representation of age groups. Um, one of the reasons I decided to to take the role of commissioner when I learned I got selected was because I saw the, uh, the rest of the commission and the average age was in their 60s. And there's nothing wrong with that, but I just wanted to make sure there was a diversity of ideas um, and you know, thought to, uh, to have maps that were representative of everybody in our state. Mm -hmm. So that might be something to do going forward. Mm -hmm. and the uh, we had no training before we were selected, absolutely zero. Um, after we were selected and after we convened, we then uh, had training from various folks. Uh, we had uh, University of Michigan, MSU come in. We had the California Commission and Arizona Commission too and give us some lectures. We uh, then had more training via our professional staff that we hired you know, to actually do, like, do the mapping with the software and whatnot. But uh, having more of that training, especially geographic training, would be really helpful. I mean. I definitely didn't know what all the counties were in Michigan before joining this, but you know I do now. I had never been to the UP prior to joining this, but uh, you know I'm happy to say I have now. Um, but training is definitely an important thing that needs to come with it. Yep. 
No, no, they, they were divided by category at every point. So they were, they were already divided prior and that they, they just, so that they picked, I guess, for, for the 180, whatever that divided by the three groups are, um, and also divided by the five instead of the four for each for the independence. Um, so there, there were separate pools at each point of the process. Okay, <laughs> uh, I, you've had your, your hand up for a while in black. Uh, what's the definition for independent? So an independent is someone who does not affiliate with either political party. Uh, we have open primaries in Michigan, so I think as long as you were not uh, registered with either party, you could have applied as an independent. Now, I'm glad you asked that question because, you know, it's self-identifying. That might be something to look at. Do you want it to be self-identifying or do you want there to be a little bit more constraints uh, in the future to make sure people are who they say they are? Um, I think everybody on our commission is who they say they were. Well, we had a lot of public outcry actually about me and another independent commissioner. Uh, you know, one day they would say I was a radical liberal, the next day they'd say I was extremely conservative. <laughs> so, you know, different people will say different things, but, but I certainly think I'm an independent and I think everyone who's an independent uh, is also an independent on our commission. But, you know, different states have different ideas of what independents are as well. You know, you guys don't have open primaries here, so y'all might need to come up with, um, you know, maybe a, a third party affiliation or, or something like that. Yeah, so the question was, was there any sort of vetting process for commissioners? Um, and there was not. There was absolutely no vetting process. Anyone who applied could have been selected. Um, we had two folks resign after their first meeting, uh, and then a, a new person was randomly drawn and ended up with the 13. But after that first meeting, after the two resigned, the rest of the 13 who were then chosen uh, all are still on today. So it, it could create some problems. You could definitely have, um, I think we kind of got lucky with who was selected. We got a good group of folks selected. You know, in the future, there's a possibility that maybe a not so good group of people are selected, but um, overall, I, I, I think the pros of a random drawing process probably outweigh the cons. Were all the simultaneous or did you start with one first? So, we, so the question was, uh, did we start, did we do each map separately right. or did we do them concurrently? We broke it down into geographical areas. So, for example, uh, we started in Lansing, Michigan, which was our capital. So we did Lansing for each map, and then we moved on to a different geographical area, whether that be Grand Rapids or Detroit or the UP. Uh, we did it geographically, where we would do a complete geographical area for one map, and move on to do that same geographical area for the next map, and then move on to a different geographical area. Now that kind of worked and it kind of didn't. We did a lot of going back uh, once we thought we had completed an area and changed it. Probably the better way to do it would be to start in the most populous places, which would uh, be, you know, in Michigan's case, the Metro Detroit area. But, uh, you know, we didn't know that at the time. Like this, but now I the yeah, of course. You know, that's, that's the, ma so the question is, if you fix one thing, it could potentially break a different thing. And how do you fix that? That's very true. Redistricting really is like putting together a big puzzle with, you know, in our case, 110 pieces, in your case, 203 pieces, and changing any one piece changes all the other pieces. Uh, so it took a lot of work. It took a lot of late nights drawing, one commissioner after another going in a circle, trying to tackle different issues uh, wherever they wanted to. And I mean, and keep in mind, this was a truncated process. We did all of these drawings in about three months due to uh, the delay in census data. So, I mean, we were working from about 7 a.m. to 10 or 11 p.m. sometimes, just, you know, drawing all in public again. Um, and, you know, we, we had some help from the public, too. People in the public would submit their advice, and we'd take a look at it and be like, oh, you know, this could work. And we'd go from there. We have time for two more questions. Okay. Who has the most important questions? What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> I see you in the back, a uh, woman in the, the classes. So, um, what exactly does it Yes. So the question was, what is a community of interest? The, the actual, the slide I had was the direct language from the Constitution. Um, a little, a few more, a little later. There we go. That's the definition according to the Michigan Constitution. What we do with it is up to the commission's discretion. So there were quite a few times where we had 
um, confounding or challenging communities of interest where one group would say, this is my community of interest. Another group would say, well, this is my community of interest. It's the exact opposite of what you think. Um, and there are a few different ways to tackle that. Sometimes we would choose different communities of interest based on the type of map. Uh, for example, in Midland, which is an area like, oh, I'm doing such a Michigan thing right now. It's like right, it's like right here in Michigan, okay? There were some folks that thought Midland should be put with its neighboring tri-cities, and there are some folks that thought it should be by itself. So the compromise we came up with was in the Senate map, where it's a larger district, we put them with their tri-cities, and with the House map, we put it by itself. Uh, that's one example of compromise. And our, our Republican commissioners were very happy about that and uh, you know, definitely swayed some votes. Um, another compromise is to follow the, like, look at the constitutional criteria and see which lower factors reinforce the communities, in, communities of interest, because they're not always mutually exclusive. Sometimes one community of interest would also help with partisan fairness or also help with having a compact map. And if that were the case, we would often choose that community of interest that helped with the other priorities as well. And then in the yellow. Ooh. That, that is a very good question. It wouldn't be the, the composition. I think the composition is quite good. I would leave it as four, four, and five. I think that's a good makeup, you know. Yes, I would agree. You know, Michigan's, uh, you know, voters, not politicians, when they put up the, the, uh, the voting initiative, they based it off of California's, but they tried to improve it. So it's probably going to take someone smarter than me to determine what, how it can be even further improved. Um, but, but there are some things that are a little bit too specific in the Michigan Constitution, like it has very specific deadline dates. I would remove those. I would um, maybe make it you know, a little bit more clear what a community of interest is or isn't. And um, I would make it more clear what we're to do now. Because now we're trying to figure out, okay, well, we're done. Once the lawsuits are, the, the Constitution says we have to stay a commission until the lawsuits are over but doesn't really say what we're to do after that. So we're trying to figure out how to disband and then what to do if there are future lawsuits, which there almost assuredly will be, uh, how to come back uh, you know, as a commission when that happens. Or do we just stay a commission for the 10 years, which is some, what some other states do. But I don't think there's really an appetite for that uh, for, for our commission. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So the question was about uh, that's kind of a question about constitutional like mandates, right, in the voting process. You know, Michigan were able to do that. There are usually like two or three uh, constitutional changes on the ballot. Just in this past election, we had a pretty good uh, right to reproductive freedom one that definitely drove out a lot of votes. But there are definitely pros and cons. You know, to to change something once it's in the constitution, the only way to do that is with another constitutional ballot, and that is quite hard to pull off if you're just trying to change one or two words in something. Um, so you know that might be where hopefully we can share these outcomes with, with folks in the legislature in your state and they can look at some of them and uh, you know come up with their own compromise on, on language so it doesn't necessarily need to be in the Constitution but could be a, a regular law. All right guys, thank you. <laughs>